Hello, I'm Douglas Stewart and this is my brother and pop, David Scott. Both of us have been writing songs for a long while, more than 30 years. And um, yeah, we've made music together and that's why I guess we're brothers and pop. Um, I am the leader and probably main songwriter, but I've collaborated with a lot of people, including David, for a band called BMX Bandits. And David's done a lot of things as well. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm also a BMX Bandit, uh, but the principal music that I've made for the last uh, 25, 30 years is with the, the Pearl Fishers, uh, and we've made nine albums, which is kind of a scary thought, uh, particularly when you try to put a set list together for a tour, uh, and, but I also teach music. I teach music at uh, UWS and a songwriting master's course, which has been interesting for me as a writer, uh, learning how to think more about about songs and what you do when you write a song, which has been great. I think I did a lot of that anyway. Yeah. Uh, but it's been good. And I make programmes for the BBC about, about Scottish music. So, yeah. yeah, it's a kind of rounded, yeah, a rounded thing. One of the first things we did, I think, actually, before you even uh, were officially a BMX Bandits was we used to go out and do songwriting workshops with members of the public who had yeah. dreams of writing songs. Well, actually, some of them already were writing songs. Yeah, and, and it's a thing that, that I do uh, to this day, and I think it's a... Uh, it's one of the things that's helped me keep, uh, I think, a strong sense of myself as a writer uh, is working with people who are maybe not, th who don't think of themselves as pros or, or young people uh, who are looking for a way to express themselves. And actually, some of the time, what you're doing there is just having fun. Mm -hmm. And as a writer, you sometimes sort of slightly loftily, you know, think of yourself as an artist, which of course you are, but sometimes it's good just to remember that people res it re react to music in a certain way which is from the heart you know mm -hmm. and and it's, it's always good to be reminded of that i think i get a lot of people um it sounds like one of these i get a lot of people <laughs> coming up to me <laughs> but i do get a lot of people uh, sending me messages or you know meeting me at shows not necessarily my own shows and saying oh how do you write your songs or you know almost what well, how do you write songs they want to maybe know for themselves and I, I think there's such an endless, even songs we've written together, there's endless combinations. It's not always been the same way. So I thought it'd be good to talk about how to write songs. And I guess one of the first things is how to make that start. Because I think whether you're a painter, um, if you're writing a book, getting that first mark on the page, so to say. Kill the canvas. Yeah, Kill is, the canvas, is yeah. for a lot of people, the difficult thing. It is, and I think, I mean, what I, as, as a, a young writer sometimes, you're so excited in the moment of, my God, I'm going to go like that, a beautiful sound comes, or learn how to play other chords, that you kind of have a lot, a big well uh, of... of they used to call it inspiration uh, to, to, to draw on it and, and, and you can kind of spill mm -hmm. music if, if, if you're lucky enough to be able to do that but you do get to a point where you have to kind of think of ways to get in at that moment uh, and, and it's, it's been something I've thought about a lot in, in, in my own career as a writer for me a lot of the, the solution to that or the, the way around it was I went to art school didn't, I didn't stay there very long because I got a record deal and uh, ran away with a circus, as it were. Uh, but my art school training was all about sketchbooks and about collecting ideas. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, typically, you would really be writing everything down or drawing everything or photographing everything that moved. Uh, and I've taken that practice into my music a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I have endless ideas. I kind of think every idea is a good idea. And you just record it in some way, document it. Uh, and then oftentimes, if you're sitting down to write a song, some of these ideas might bubble up. Or if you're really kind of uh, stuck for, for, for mm -hmm. a place to start, I think it's good to go back to those things. And I've got yeah. a lot of songs that way. I mean, Pete, Pete Warman, who's a very different songwriter than you and I, or people would think of. Richard. Yeah, well, <laughs> he would always say that. You know, you would hear someone going, I should be so lucky and go, I'm mm -hmm. writing that down. Because yeah. someday... That's going to be a song. Yeah, absolutely, and I think I think that's that's a great a great way to do it. You, you've got music, you know, you've got musical ways to do it, you know, because you, you you learn how to write melodies by doing it uh, over and over again. You learn more about chords and harmony. You learn how to put those together. But it's it's putting those kind of things together with an interesting uh, concept. And yeah, so, so killing the canvas is important. Making a mark. I, I said there was one. The, the, there was a song on, on the new uh, Pearl Fisher record called "Love and Other Hopeless Things," uh, which got started as many of my things do 
just with me meandering on the keyboard. My gran, uh, my mother's mother, uh, used to sit at the piano in our house, and she wasn't a musician, mm -hmm. but she would just play melodies. I think she was making them up. I think she'd mm -hmm. be either maybe try to remember hymns that she knew or something like that. Uh, and I always find that an interesting thing because it was just a, a melody, and I still do that. Uh, and I had this little uh, circular thing when... Um Something like that, round and round and round, and I just recorded it, put it away. Uh, and then I had this idea of, of uh, I had this uh, daydream that George Martin phoned me up, right? And I met George Martin in the, in, in the 80s very briefly. Producer of the Beatles, just yeah. in case people... And, 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 he, and he said to me in the dream, we're, we're putting Silla Black back in the studio, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to do it like the oldies, have you got any songs? A great dream, <laughs> right? Uh, and I thought, God, that's a great idea for a, for a song. I could just write a song that I thought would be a song. And I, I just, what, what melodies, what ideas I've got? Another foggy Monday morning Sail the ferry to town And think of all the people's dreams That's just that melody, you know? Like boat seer in blue stocking on a dress down day Well you're gonna dress up anyway This old town was every jewel prize I'm getting selling out Like a miracle that split the skies <laughs> Between grey and you By coffee too You think of all the people's dreams Imagine them as silver sails Sinking beneath the waves Like you But coffee three will get you through One more gilded spring Of love and other hopeless things I know I'm thinking about Liverpool, right? And, uh, how the cellar would be in Streaming from the subway trains Brutal as temples Raising their eyes in pain or Some kind of mythical wonder How did it get to this? Lying wide awake all night And just take what it brings Love and other hopeless things But it goes on, I won't play the whole thing But the, the so the, so, the song kind of got going from that yeah. That little snaky melody uh, Then that idea of writing a song for Scylla And thinking what it would sound like And then I was thinking about Liverpool And I was thinking about people streaming from subway trains Brutalist temples, you know, modernist buildings Like, you know, so it suddenly starts to kind of collide But what it comes from is that well, I guess on a piano, thing, you know that, it, that probably creates. Well, I think you're like me in this way. It creates a visual picture in your mind yeah. when you hear a certain melody, certain notes. Creates a visual picture, and so you you can see the way the people are moving and all these sort of things. Not everybody has that thing, but something else that's interesting there is, I think, the idea of writing a song for another person. I mean, yeah. my first hit, and I used the term loosely. A song called "You Wanna Tour" with my friend Sean Dixon, and when I was writing the melody and the words for that, I was thinking about Ivor Cutler, and I was imagining him singing, "I'm so happy, love has come to town." I never knew that. That's great. And I don't yeah. sing it in that way. And the kind of arrangement that Sean came up for it took it to a completely different world. But it was a starting point. Yeah. The starting point was, I think. Who could I write a song for that I think is more interesting than me? <laughs> and, I mean, I still, you know, we, we've done a, a songs that, for BMX Bandits that we've written for, you know, um, or I, I've done with other people, a female voice or another another singer 
um, within the world of beam expanders or whatever. And so you're you're it, that's another certain point. But the other thing I find interesting about that song, or one of the many things I find interesting about it is it's very much about place. And it's a place you don't come from in that one. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like you have you ha- I think you have been to Liverpool, I'm pretty sure you I have. have. Yeah. You've got a, a reasonably things, good yeah. knowledge of Liverpool. But you're still an outsider coming into it and you have a different romantic view, probably partly because of things like the Beatles and just a whole lot of other things that someone living in Liverpool won't see that version of Liverpool. It's like when Billy Billy Wilder made all these amazing films about America, Billy Wilder was a guy who came from Austria on a boat, didn't speak any English, and he made some films that just crystallise American life way more than American filmmakers could make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree, and I, I think yeah. So part of it is myth making. Yeah. Uh, but but also part of it is is you know thinking about atmosphere as well. <laughs> I remember the first time I ever went to uh, Liverpool was on tour with Ricky Ross, and I said to Ricky, "I love it so much here. I'm going to come back on my holidays." <laughs> and he used to laugh about that. But but I, I suppose what I meant was I felt such an affinity immediately with it with the the, the smell of the place mm. and the colour of it, uh, and I felt that it was a place like Glasgow where you can. Actually, hear the music that came from it almost in the atmosphere. Yeah, and I suppose that that, that song, uh, "Love and Other Hopeless Things," that I kind of an attempt to to, to at least capture it, and, and I used I used Scylla as my voice. A place closer to home, and probably the place closest possibly to your heart, is Falkirk. And also, I mean, there's been several of your songs, but Falkirk's like a major character. Lo- lots of them, yeah. In in in, in your songs, yeah. well, I think. Uh, I learned, I suppose the thing is, when you grow up in a town, it doesn't matter where you are, it's always the greatest town in the world, right? Whether you live there, and I don't, but, but the, the, the town has such an impact on you. You're the same with Bells Hill. Uh, and, and you do a lot of your thinking about what the world means and what you mean in the world. Uh, so a lot of my songs have been about uh, folk, about leaving folk, about going back there, about what the town means to me. But it also I think it, it, it relates to some of my early experiences of, of making music, which were uh, f- experiences in Falkirk Folk Club. Uh, so the first gig I ever did was as a floor singer in Falkirk Folk Club. I used to go down there with Lee and, uh, and Irene and, and, and just enjoy the music there. And you could go up and say, can I play a couple of songs? And they would. And so I would go up and do really, really, sort of, you know, what would be considered a gaff? I would play a Paul McCartney song, right? The folk club, and your people would be like, oh, "My God!" But it was the it was the the sense of going there and and being engaged in the music community. Uh, but I think it had a big impact on the way that I write as well, because so many of my songs are have got a folk a traditional structure to them. Uh, there's one there's one a folk song called "I Was a Cowboy." And it's it's the harmony of it's not folky. It's more like kind of uh, English pop music, you know, of the sixties. It's one of those descending things. That's an important thing in the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about growing up in Falkirk. There's three episodes in it. Each one of them is 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 broadly true. There's uh, some choices in the song that that. So I, I mean, as a writer, as a lyricist, that was probably quite, my God, right? Uh, but it was important to me to do that. Uh, but the structure of it is, is what we'd say, A-A-A. So people that don't really know about technical song structures, it's like a folk structure where you've got a verse, another verse, and another verse. And what it kind of does is tell a story, and in this case, in different episodes. Before you uh, actually play a wee bit, one of the things I'm just going to put in a wee bit is one of the things I think both you and I very much believe in is the thing that you were hinting at there some of the things that you chose to put in were a bit oh well a little bit embarrassing put you in a vulnerable place almost Mm -hmm. and I think both of us probably believe if you find yourself doing that don't walk away from that yeah hopefully the the things that put you in vulnerable (laughs) places I think very often are the things actually you go I'm probably putting because I'm reacting to this and going so it's probably mm. going to touch other people. Yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's one of my favourite songs you've written. I mean, you've written a, a lot of songs I love, but this is one that really touches me. Thank you, Dr. Douglas. This, and one of the things I was saying there, it's about, it's about being young and growing up 
and and wondering what your place is in the world. In my case, there are Falkirk places in this song. Uh, but there's a, there's a thing in the harmony that I, I do I always try and use harmony and melody to, to put across a message or a concept. And there's a thing about uh, optimism in this. I'll stop when I pl- I'll play the song, but I'll maybe stop at those bits. And, uh, I was a cowboy in my neighbourhood Spinning along the hedgerows Strawberry, sherbet and gum Were the tools of my trade Thought I'd grow handsome Funny and free Boys in the third grade To the school of St. Francis Saviour Pretty Miss Hollis was waiting to lead me away Her breasts were tender And I confess I cried the whole day My face in the folds of her dress. I was a cowboy. Soon I was grown and my branches were strong, and the halo of spring was round me, spilling my youth out in tissues on warm afternoons. I met some sweet girls Acted unkind Down by the sand dunes Striking the truth of life from my mind I was a cowboy Put in that, the major, funny and free, always to, to indicate optimism. Yeah. Boys in the third grade could never hold a candle to me. I was a cowboy. So there you go. Kills me every time. <laughs> but it's interesting because that song. And I, I think this has happened with a lot of uh, the songs that I'm kind of proudest with or I've had the best reaction I've written or other friends have written. It's some ways so specific to such personal experiences and in such a personal landscape, but somehow those songs I often find are the ones that touch people most universally. It's almost counterintuitive. It's, it's a di- well, it's a, it, and it's a big, I think as a writer, it's a, it's a conversation that you have with yourself all the time. Does this actually mean anything to anybody? You know, and you know some some of the times no, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and in that case you have to push on and, and think. Well, I need to write something that means something to me as an artist first. That needs to to resonate. It needs to make you feel something. Uh, but you do always kind of try, I think, and find something in a song that 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 translates. I've got one of my songs, "My Dad the Weather Fan." Just got started as a, as a, a kind of joke in a way, mm-hmm. uh, which was about how much my dad. Uh, trusted the weather reports, right? Uh, so I had these kind of, not funny, but sort of, you know, light verses. My dad, the weather fan, puts his trust in the weatherman, always knows when the rains 
RRG Isn't shocked when the sun breaks through Takes a look out the window But the snow doesn't worry him Gets a hat and some gardening shoes To tell the flowers the sunny news Chorus Across the sky Angels push the clouds away I wanna live in your way I wanna live in your way And though I try I can't believe in anything Chorus kind of says this big thing, yeah. which is I've I've got no faith, <laughs> you yeah, know. I wish I could be. I've got like no this faith, but person. you have, and that's what I want. Yeah. You know, uh, and the verses are kind of funny. That you know, uh, there's a little bit. You know, gets a gin and a cigarette and stands yeah, outside. It's like a humorous picture. But you got you know. So in this song, there's an attempt in the chorus to 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 put you know to get right to the nub of the thing. Yeah. I mean, I spoke to. Great musician, great singer, interpreter of other people's songs, but also a great songwriter in his own right, Robert Wyatt, about songwriting. And he was saying that for him, a lot of his songs are quite political, quite but quite heavy messages that are obviously very important to him. But he said that humour and melody are like the two greatest gifts a songwriter has because they bypass people's intellect and go straight to their heart. Mm-hmm. So in a song like that, to me it's almost like you're using the humour and the melody to kind of get in there. Mm-hmm. People are engaged, we're kind of... And then you almost then kind of come and go, not in a nasty way, but you're slightly pulling a rug from beneath them because they're with you and suddenly they're like, I'm involved in this story, I can see the man out in his garden, or he reminds me a little bit of my Uncle Fred or whatever. Yeah. And then... But it's about faith. It's about and faith. It's about and something that's, that's really, really... And, and the other thing, I mean, this is one thing I've learned from all the years that I've worked in, in, in music education, uh, is that we tend to, to kind of analyse songs often just from a lyrical perspective. But the melody, the thing that, that is often the thing that tells you something uh, more conceptual about the song. Oh, yeah. And that song, it's not just the, the kind of... Uh, the lyric and the, the kind of I want to live in your way thing, but the way that the melody then actually rises as well, it tells you something about the the strength of feeling or, or yeah. how important that message is. And if you to listen to every recording of that, I mean, the arrangement, you're illustrating all these different weather things that are happening. You know, you're, you're, it's all, you know, it's all, it's, it reminds me, and again, I'm sure you'll know what I mean here, I mean, it's common. Is when I was a kid at school, we would play this music and go, and here's a swan, and here's a such and such, and here's a storm cloud. And, you know, some people would be like, what? But for me, I would be going, totally. I totally, I totally get to that. I relate to that. And, um, but one of the things I think is interesting about that is choices you make. Because sometimes you and I have written songs and you make the choice, I'm going to start the chorus. That song, you it would be a completely different thing if you'd started with the whole declaration of I don't have faith, you know, even though it's a really strong hooky chorus, but, you know, why you make that decision to go, no, I'm going to start painting this little picture and then, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and in that case, it it was also allowed me to start with with the title of the song, My Dad the Weather Fan. Mm -hmm. uh, That's an interesting idea. Which which is an interesting idea. It it mangles language a little bit. Uh, And also, I think... I know from from my listening to other music, people are going to be saying, what is this all about? My dad, the weather fan, puts his trust in the weatherman. And if you get past that, and the, and the, kind of, you know, the music kind of carries it, mm-hmm. carries your interest through, then you maybe get something more out of the chorus when, when, the, when, the, when you do get the punch right to the gut, mm-hmm. you know, which is what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know... You know a lot of the chords. You know a lot of the chords. I don't know. I don't, I don't know any of the chords. I'm a kazoo. But... Sometimes I think some songwriters might go, oh, well, it looks like it's maybe easy for these guys because they've been making music for a long while. They're very, very accomplished. But sometimes um, one of our friends and a songwriter who's really great and been very successful, sometimes you can, 
actually a limitation almost of chords. Actually having your limitations, you can actually sometimes use their stress um, as a strength. I'm thinking of Chip Taylor, who's a songwriter. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, he has quite a lot of his songs. He wrote Wild Thing, <laughs> and he wrote Angel of the Morning, Any Way You Want Me. All of those songs seem like very different songs. I mean, Angel of the Morning, this beautiful, tender song about, you know, a lover leaving you in the morning yeah. and your kind of, I guess, doubts and insecurities. And then Wild Thing, which is just this basic, about 15 words, wild thing you make my heart. These songs sound so different, but at the heart of them is basically the same chords, pretty One, much. One, four, five chords. C, F and G, yeah. And also the same rhythm. Up. It's not even the same chords in a mm-hmm. kind of different rhythm. Mm-hmm. But... What you do on top of those chords, you've got lots of choices, and I mean you've got examples. I think it's, well, it's, fun, it's a it's, it's a great that's a great topic for conversation. Like what, one of the things that that I think uh, young writers or, or writers who maybe not as uh, experienced uh, can sometimes tend to do is to, because the natural instinct is to start off with the chords, and then sometimes the melody will cling for dear life yeah. to those chords, and the melody becomes almost just like a description of the the chords. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's one thing that you can start doing as a writer when you're trying to make your songs a bit more interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm very aware recently that these two chords, F major 7th, C major 7th, uh, turn up in so many of my songs in the, exactly the same way. I'm just drawn to that rhythm in those... But I always try, so I've got... The, like, we'll get by from uh, the young pick picnickers we can live with the magic yeah okay so it's like a a chant uh and then when i was a young sappy boy looking for a way to make a mark somebody at school heard me sing that's told as god and it's got a different kind of yeah, they, they don't sound the same. No, and then you've got something like, I suppose, uh, uh, t- uh, that's not Todd is God, that's Fighting Fire with Flowers. Todd is God is, uh, he can paint you a day if the covers washed away. So they're very different. Ga- so I think the, the, the point is, and we'd never compare us to somebody like uh, Chip Taylor, the, the sort of sheer, visceral power of his songwriting, but actually, you can use simple chords, but as a writer, I think you're always trying to find a way to make the melody interesting, the rhythm of the melody, uh, the, the kind of height of the melody. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things about Paul McCartney as a as a songwriter is the sheer amount of ground he covers in songs. That's one of the reasons these songs are so interesting mm-hmm. because there's. Stu- but by the same token, you get some of like uh, his his great partner John Lennon, who who tended to be a more limited melody writer, but Conceptually, the songs just had so much power. Anyway, I'm getting off the topic. The, the, the point is, yeah, the, the way that you use melody in an interesting uh, way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, another, and, and, and I guess that's uh, the other thing that I like and somehow like to compare myself to one of the greatest songwriters of the pop era, <laughs> Bert Bacharach, um, for different, very different reasons here. Um, you and Bert. Yeah, well, we're like peas in a pod. <laughs> um, neither of us... Um, write our songs at an instrument, apparently. And Bert Bacharach, who, again, he knows all the chords. I mean, you know, he's this... Uh, he knows even more chords he, than me. You know, he's a really skilled <laughs> musician. But he has a thing of... He, I remember hearing him say something like, and I apologise if it's not exactly right, but that even someone with his musical ability and knowledge tends to gravitate to the same places, that, that's the right. same shapes. That's right. So what he does is he writes a melody that's like taking a line for a walk. It can go anywhere. And then he finds with his amazing facility for chords and for music, the right chords, the right rhythmical things to get the best out of that melody. But yeah. And that's what formal composers would do, you know, and what we think of broadly as, as classical music. You know, the, the, you know, composers would never dream of writing a, a chord sequence first. 
get a melody, make it start, get themes, repeat the themes, harmonize those. And what that does is it tends to, to promote melodies that are memorable because they've got to stand on their own two feet. Yeah. And very often, I mean, when I'm writing a song, sometimes obviously I've written songs that I've, I've been writing words to a tune someone else has come up with or I'm sitting actually working with them on a thing. But quite often I come in, because I don't play any instruments uh, and I don't know all the formal rules, I come in and I sing a melody and I describe a kind of mood, I describe a kind of atmosphere and then someone like yourself or another musical friend or friends will, together will will find the chords and the, the kind of rhythms and things. So even if you don't play an instrument, it doesn't mean you can't write songs. Because my dad used to say to me, because I went to guitar lessons for five years and can't play, but he'd go, how can you write songs? You can't play an instrument. But these things don't need to stop you. Sometimes friends who are really great musicians have said to me, somebody wouldn't come up with that if we no, like knew that, all the rules. That, that, that is true. And so, um, you know, everything, limitations can be an advantage as well as a disadvantage, I would say. There, there was one, uh, it's funny when you talk about that, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering uh, we wrote a lot of songs together for, for uh, BMX Bandit's album, Bee Stings. And what I remember about that was how quickly they were done. Yeah. Uh, something like two or three days, and I think we, we, we wrote something like six, seven songs. Uh, one of the things about those, though... And recorded them. And record, yeah, that's true. <laughs> that but, but some of those were quite simple. Um, yeah. I, was, I was thinking about so many colours. Oh, yeah. Well, that was a song I started having an idea for in Japan. We'd travelled one way in a journey to Japan in a van through the kind of mountains, and... I think when we were, I can't remember if we were going back, but I think when we were going back, we were maybe, we were travelling on a train, and there was this little ding, ding, yeah. ding, ding, chime, and every time I heard that, for some reason, I was thinking about the other journey we had, which was through mountains, and to me, that just conjured up a certain type of music, like a uh, snowbird and things, a kind of mountain music, kind of rhythm kind of thing, and... I started hearing the combination of this kind of mountain music and this ding ding, but also this yeah. visual picture of. I remember kind of I was looking at someone and thinking, "Colour of their eyes," and then I sort of thought, "Oh, there's so many colours in their eyes," and then I sort of thought, "And there's so many colours <laughs> in you." So we wrote this song called yeah, "So Many we, Colours." We should play it. Yeah, it's simple. Is that the right? Is that the right key? So many. That's it. So can a mountain, mountain So many colours in your eyes So many colours in you You're so dumb and yet so wise Next to you I am a fool So rest your head on his fool Safe look in my eyes And let me see inside And then we can say to repeat So many colors in your eyes So many colors in you You're so dumb and yet so wise Next to you I am a fool So rest your head on his fool's chest you go when it is time You'll be safe Look in my eyes And let me see inside And then you need some new And though you're with me now I know you will be gone In the morning And I know I'm not the one Who'll see your waking eyes Or your young Sparkling So many colors in your eyes So many colors in you You're so dumb and yet so wise Next to you I am a fool So rest your head on his fool's chest I'll let you go when it is time 
safe look in my eyes Let me see inside You'll be safe look in my eyes And let me see inside And that's one of the songs in that album I think a lot of people really react to it in a big way, but it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah. And we made some choices there of, rather than writing three separate verses, actually choosing to stick with that one verse and just reinforce it. Yeah. And of course, it's an AABA form song, which is which is another one of those things that, you know, like, like cl- it's in the classic mode of that, you know, verse, verse, uh, you know, Other se- section <laughs> verse, and, and there's, it's 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 circular in that sense. So it, it has a kind of simplicity about the form, and you know. and how I remember that really being written was I had this melody, I had this idea, and I knew you love songs like Snowbird and things. So yeah. you knew, I knew you knew the musical form, and you understood it back to front. And so I think pretty much I sang the first line. You went, okay, what well, keys? I started playing it. We played the first verse, and then we're like, let's do that verse again, and uh, you added your harmony. So it's like something new and interesting has happened to that, which brings in new emotionals, new emotionals, new emotions. Yeah. And then the band, the new I emotionals. think while we were playing it, a bit like I said when we were doing it, you said, and now let's go to somewhere else. And you just started playing. There was no lyrics written for this, but I think you maybe even sang, and though I'm with you. And boy, I'm with you now. Yeah, it might have even been da-da-da-da-da. Yeah, some things, that's the way, yeah. And there wasn't any pause. It was just almost like, I wonder what will happen if we just continue here. We didn't sit and go, well, that, would that work? We sang it. And then that bit ended just naturally as we sang it. And that was how it existed in the final thing. And then we went, and let's return to it a bit more almost reflective again, that final verse, just to reinstate. That's what it was. And... Yeah, so it's funnily enough, one of the songs that puts me in mind, a very different song, there's a song called Everybody's Got to Learn Sometime by the Oh, that's a beautiful song, yeah. And it's got this one verse that repeats. Mm -hmm. But there is a version out there that I reckon someone, some exec at a record company's went, you need to have a second verse. You need to have Mm -hmm. a different verse. And there is a version you can hear, you can track down, which has another verse. Uh Uh-oh. It does not have the same power. Okay. It's not nearly as good, and I believe it wouldn't have had the same level of success if we went back and stuck to that version, which just yeah. repeated that very Yeah, sometimes it, I think it's one of the things about... You, uh, you talked earlier on about choices you make as a writer, and I think it's something that, uh, that I think all creative people have to think about, whether you're making a, a film or writing a book or whatever, uh, what do you put in and what do you leave out? And sometimes, if you've said it, you know, if you said mm. it in the first verse or the second verse, or whatever, yeah, it's interesting to give people more information, but if it doesn't need it, you need to make that call, mm. I think. And if you make the wrong call, then you've written a song that's not as good. But if you get it right and, and, and the simplicity of the thing gets to the heart, of the heart and soul of it, it can be great. I mean, going to another, I think for a songwriter, and that song's, a, a, again, a relevant example of this, go in, go, if you're finding yourself in a jam writing songs, take a trip somewhere. It could be just a day trip to the seaside or to a town you never visited or somewhere that was important to you when you were a kid. Uh, For us, we ended up in Japan. We were very, very fortunate to end up in Japan. And the amount of songs or germs of songs, I think that both of us came, you came on with with lots of stuff in your sketchbook because I was seeing you doing lots of sketches, drawings, writing down phrases, you know, taking photographs of signs and Mm -hmm. things you were seeing, pictures of incredible scenes. And one of those incredible scenes, I think, for the first time Andy's visited Japan, there's a spot in Shibuya. Oh, yeah. Which mm. is pretty much almost the busiest, maybe, uh, crossroad of streets in the world with all these people going to work, going home from work. And this particular day, it was raining and there yeah. was a sea of umbrellas. That's right. It was an, an amazing uh, visual uh, kind of thing. So sometimes for me, again, right back to the start when we started talking uh, today, I was talking about art school and, and sketchbooks and, and gathering things, and, and often it's it's gathering things physically as 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 I do often, but sometimes it's also just gathering a moment and thinking right that this is something to be uh, savoured, and, and that 
crossing at Shibuya a train station with all these coloured umbrellas going back and forward. Uh, if, you, if you search for the umbrellas of Shibuya on the internet, you either get the Pearl Fisher's uh, umbrellas of Shibuya or photographs of these umbrellas going back and forward. Uh, and the thing... That's the thing that I start to hear. So in the song, there's all this whole long instrumental thing before any vocals start. It's like a painting in music. So I was thinking, yeah, like a, a movie scene. Saturday early, it's 8.43. Rain pulls away from this human sea. Fluorescent chocolatiers lining our way. Well, please buy my words for Valentine's Day. Japanese skies full of the card and the jib punctuation. Filling my car I was asleep But I'm waking up Up from the bridge We see over a town The umbrellas of ship Spinning around The banker, the lawyer The young Tokyo crew Safe under a sky Of polythene blue Douglas, just think <laughs> If we could bottle each drop Of this feathered rain Package it up Sell it on to the farmers of England To grow neon roses on Saul's replace I was lost, I'd reached the limit I couldn't find one happy day The trouble came, brother, I'd be in it <laughs> wow. And a second. What am I to do? Where am I to go? If I ever lose it. One of the things that strike me about that song, apart from it conjures up amazing shared memories, and I think there's interesting little things here actually where you say things like we rather than I, because it's about a shared experience and you bring me in as a character. Mm -hmm. I've got a thing, I'll bring people in as, as characters and songs, you know, don't, I think it's a good thing, you know, you bring in someone who, it could be a version of someone you know, but there's that, the, the thing of you bringing in characters, but there's also a thing, and this is actually more to do with how you perform a song like that sometimes, how you present it to the world. And I'm not talking about even the eventual recording. 
I think one of the things that's very important is you and I, if we're performing a song, we don't perform it as in a, we don't apologise for the song. Well, that's. Uh, and I find, but I find yeah, yeah, so good, many good. songwriters, even songwriters with I think really lovely songs, I'll see someone go on stage and they start apologising for the song. And I think it might seem slightly off topic, but I think it's an important thing. You know, if you're going to make a statement, you actually owe something to your songs. You, you do, your work. You, you do, and, and I think you also need to kind of, yeah, you need you need to, to to believe it's worth it's worth saying. What one of the things about that mm. is about the about the dynamic in it, and right. and it's also that we we start talking about other forms as well, books and, and and cinema and all that. The way you think about it in that song is different scenes. So so. Uh, the first verse paints a certain scene. I mean, well, first and foremost, the, the instrumental intro paints mm-hmm. a certain scene. Uh, and then you've got the the uh, Saturday morning, it's 8.43. So specific things. Mm-hmm. It was specifically 8.43. And I was thinking about the precision. Mm-hmm. Remember, the, remember the conductor coming down and, and, and oh apologising? The, the train's going to be... The train's going to be one minute late. He's <laughs> bowing and all this, right? So, so 8.43, a train pulls away from this human sea. So it's about painting pictures. Mm-hmm. And then the second verse, it becomes a bit surreal. Mm-hmm. Douglas just think if we could bottle each drop of this feather drain, package it, sell it on the farmers, and you would grow neon roses. So it becomes... And then, I was lost, I'd reached the limit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that then talks about something that I'd gone through. Suddenly it's not our our conversation, it's I was lost, Mm -hmm. you know? And, And... the music changes, but the performance changes as well. And I think, I think, again, one of the things I try to do writing songs is, is think about the function of different parts of the song. What are they trying to do? What is the impact they're trying to have? But I think also, uh, what is the narrative of the person that's at the heart of the song? Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the way that people can relate to it. I don't know. And there was a lot about that trip, which I think for all of us, there was a big part of it. That, what, what, what did that trip give us? And one of the things definitely was that thing of making you feel like you had a purpose, sort of, again. I don't mean just yeah, you yeah, specifically. No, it just seems yeah, yeah. you know, very much like, oh, people actually care about this and care about fashion. Like, oh, so you sort of, you go away a, a long way and you actually find yourself somewhere else again, which mm. is an interesting thing. Um, pretty near at, at the close of this conversation, I, I, ho- I think there's so many things that we could talk about. I think we should have another one of these at some point. But today I thought, let's wrap up with a song. I think we should go out with a song and I'm going to leave it to you as your guest yeah, to was, decide what we should go out with. I thought we might do that and, and, and I was thinking about two things. One is maybe doing something from New Pearl Fisher's record, but I think we've talked about so many uh, things that make sense with, with this particular song, which is something... It's the first thing I, I really sang in a folk club. Right. Uh, it's a song called Lord Franklin. And uh, who, who's, it, what's it, the origins of that song? The, well, the origin, it, it's, a, it's, it's not that uh, old a song. People would think of it as a traditional mm-hmm. song, but it refers to Lord Franklin, uh, the explorer whose ship got uh, was lost and it became a sort of cause celebre uh, just 150 years ago or something. Yeah. And actually, recently, I think they actually found the ship abandoned somewhere. Right. As, as the ice is melting, all of these things are, 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 are being given up again. I heard on a Pentangle record, Bert Jan, she was, a, was and remains an important uh, musician for me and a songwriter. Uh, but what I loved about this song was was the storytelling in it, and mm-hmm. it's one of those AAA songs. Uh, and then later on, when I made the second Pearl Fishers record, uh, I had this idea to do like a Bird's A type version of mm-hmm. it. Uh, and we did this very kind of cinematic version of Lord Franklin. It's a song I keep returning to. It's one of the songs of my life. Yeah, you know. Um, and I guess you've probably you feel some of your own music. In some it's way, in there's, there. a, there's a lineage. Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there, there's, there's, you know, I've been talking about scenes, you know, and, and and images and different perspectives and all that. All of it's in this song. So I've loved that, and um, yeah, it's been such a pleasure. I mean, to I, we don't get to spend enough time t- together and uh, talk about these incredibly important things. And some of the greatest moments of our life have been, uh, I guess, wrapped around making music together. And I've, I've had a, a wonderful time, and I'm looking forward to because you introduced me to this song, and it's a song that I love very much, uh, Lord Franklin. So thank you very much, David. And thank you. Take it away. Yeah, okay. To 
He's homeward bound one night on the deep Swinging in my hammock, I fell asleep I dreamed a dream, and I thought it true Concerning Franklin and his gallant crew With a hundred seamen he sailed away To the frozen ocean in the month of May Sometimes go Cruel hardships They mainly strove The ship on mountains Of ice was thrown Only the Eskimo In his skin Baffin Bay, where the whale fish blow. The fates of Franklin, no man may know. The fates of Franklin, no tongue can tell. Lord Franklin alone, the sailors do dwell. Franklin lives Lord Franklin